of course. Okay, that should be working, I guess. Very good. So I, I think you may start slowly because some people will still arrive and then... Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. It's, it's really a great pleasure for me to be the moderator in this final uh, morning session of the school. And I'm also very pleased to introduce Professor Wiesman. Uh, thanks a lot for contributing at uh, this school and the talk is very exciting. It is about photonic micro robotics and artificial intelligence. So thanks a lot, Diederik, and please. So thank you, Claudio, and thank you, Sergey, and all the people who contributed to organizing the school. Um, it's really uh, strange for me to be at the Como Lake uh, School uh, and still be in my office because this is, a, the, especially the schools are a place where um, I have great memories uh, uh, from the past, both as a student, as a lecturer and an organizer, but we will try to make the best of it. Um, so uh, the title is Photonic Micro Robotics and Responsive Materials for Artificial Intelligence. So what I'm going to talk about um, today is um, a materials platform um, which we've been working on for these last years. Um, so it is a lot about the materials and how they behave. And the idea is that these materials um, are useful for making photonic micro robotics, uh, which is what we've been working on for uh, quite some time now and which has been um, quite successful. And um, since some time now, we are uh, discussing amongst us um, how these same materials could be made useful for making uh, photonic uh, neural networks. And that is at the level of an idea. So there is no uh, results there yet, but I think that this material platform is very promising for that. And so that's why I want to share that with you. And of course, uh, of, if somebody else has ideas, then this is always very uh, welcome, of course. So um, um, we have been having endless discussions on how to uh, use these materials for uh, neural networks. And um, I think they are promising. And well, you will see how it goes. And then maybe we can have some discussion or also afterwards, if somebody wants to contact me, then uh, please do so. Um, let me um, start with the, so the people involved, um, basically in the column on the left, you see, oh, sorry, the column on the left, you see the, um, the people uh, in the group at the moment, um, of which uh, Daniele, Sara and Camilla are the ones who are more directly involved in the um, materials that I'm talking about now. And Camilla in particular, um, she is responsible for all the chemistry and for setting up the chemistry lab uh, with a strong input uh, from Daniele and many other people who are there now at the moment who are actually making the molecules that I'm talking about. And without the molecules and without the materials, nothing of what we are going to see today would have been possible. So this is a very important part of the chemistry. Um, and then on the right, in the bottom, there are two people that I want to mention explicitly. The, the people on the right are people who are now in other parts of the world and some, most of them have their own research groups successfully in, in different parts. People that came from our group and now are um, uh, leading their own uh, uh, research lines in different parts of the world. But in particular, I would like to mention uh, Piotr Vasilchik and Hao Zeng. Piotr Vasilchik was already uh, a professor when he came to our group and he gave an, a tremendous input in um, making the robots work. And Hao Zeng, um, who was a very brilliant um, a PhD student who is now also um, pursuing his career and he also had uh, some very significant input in the robots um, and, and getting them uh, to walk, actually. You will see that later. Um, just nice to see also some faces of people, especially now that we're all online. So this is uh, only part of the people because uh, we, we don't have an updated uh, photo and then people are changing all the time. But this is a quite recent photo, let's say, of a group photo and uh, in front of the lens building. So um, I am located, uh, mainly the research is mainly located at Lens, but is uh, increasing, increasingly important also at the uh, INRIM laboratory, which is in Turin, um, which is a, actually a metrology institute. 
um, of which I also have the responsibility of its organization. But apart from that, um, there are some very beautiful uh, nanostructural, nano, nano facilities and clean room facilities. And some of the people in our group are actually now researchers at uh, INRIM. And LENS is where the, 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 the labs are, um, uh, which I started my uh, research career, which I've always been, and I'm a professor at the University of Florence. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to talk about a materials platform. Um, so um, let me start with a very general introduction. This is a school, not a conference. So it's, uh, we're here to also to learn something. So I'm really targeting this for the students. And um, so smart materials in general, let's say we're talking about materials that are um, somehow intelligent as, as far as a material can be intelligent, or let's say they have some responsiveness to their environment. And uh, on, as a matter of introduction, to give you some very nice examples, which are uh, uh, which 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 are which are around, you can have triggers. Huh? The stimuli can be from from temperature, stress, PhD, uh, P P S PhD, <laughs> the, sorry, uh, uh, pH, uh, so uh, acidity of the environment, uh, electric magnetic fields, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and light, and that's what it is about in in my talk today. But before we get to light as, a, as an external trigger, um, let me show you some other examples. This is a nice example of a, of a shape memory material. Um, so you open that, but it remembers how it was before the material. Inside its structure, there is still memory of the original shape. So then you heat it and it will just go back to the shape that it was before. So this is an example as you can find on the internet of a, of a shape memory material. This is something that you can call a responsive or, or a smart material. Uh, you deform it and it has the structural uh, information inside still. This is another example here. Um, we didn't want to have the, 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 we don't need the audio. So these are materials that when you, when you heat them or when you, uh, and they also change shape. And there, this is one that goes, this is a very nice one up and it gets into this star shape. Okay, now we're going to talk about materials that um, uh, are uh, polymers, not metals. Um, metals can also do these tricks, but we're talking about polymers here. And um, we are talking of a specific kind of polymer, which is um, an elastomer or a liquid crystalline elastomer. So um, liquid crystals, most of you probably know, liquid crystals are materials that have uh, a form of orientational order. So um, they can have uh, a, a, a certain alignment. Here you see an example of how such an alignment looks like, that the molecules are oriented in a certain direction. So our materials that we are talking about, they have the properties of liquid crystals in the sense that they have some partial alignment of the molecules. And they're also um, elastomers. Um, so they are uh, rubber-like uh, materials and they have a certain uh, amount of flexibility. So if you put it all together, it is a liquid crystalline elastomer. Um, it, this is a polymer, a polymer that has some orientational properties. Um, on top of that, um, it is more than just a polymer. So here you see the chains of the polymer. They are aligned in a certain direction, but you see also here this cross linkers. So it is like a regular polymer, but on top of that, there are uh, these links between the polymer chains. And then, as you can see, you can go from one kind of configuration to another configuration to a more disordered configuration. And that is associated, you can see that here in the bottom, with the change of shape of the material. And that is all, that is what we need in this, um, in this talk, in this platform that I'm talking about. We need something that changes shape. So if it goes from this aligned, ordered form, these liquid crystalline um, elastomers, uh, due to their structure, due to their cross-linkers and uh, several of their properties. They, for instance, in the case if you have a block here of material, this block becomes shorter and it becomes broader. So it really changes significantly shape. If you would have a, a strip of material and uh, you would, for instance, shine light on it so that it changes shape, the whole strip of material would come up like 50% like, like or so. But if you would, if you would attach uh, something heavy like a watch and you would attach it to the strip, it would pull it up. So it's a very strong and a very big effect. Here you see a piece of elastomer which is being illuminated. 
This is a movie by uh, Peter Palfi at Kent State University with whom we also collaborate. We like to collaborate with people around the world because I mean, we're doing research and research is having fun. And it means also that doing things together is even more fun. So um, here we have uh, a small movie that he made where you have this disc of elastomer. It's pretty big, it's a few centimeters or so, or a centimeter, I don't know exactly, but it's microscopic. And you flash light on it and then it responds. And it responds by changing shape. And in this case, it bends. Now, what did we want, what did we want to do originally? This was uh, a project proposal for the ERC, which was uh, financed. And the original idea was that we would like to do uh, robotics with it. And um, a lot of the things that you will see here uh, will be um, will be in that in that in that topic. Let's say on, uh, in that in that context of, of making micro robots, and especially we want to make them very small, so of the length scale of really uh, significantly below uh, a millimeter. And so think of what what we had in mind. We want to make uh, out of this polymer some kind of photonic structure. Um, I've as, as, as an example, I've put there a little piece of photonic crystal, um, just uh, it doesn't have to be like that, but it, it gives you an idea. Then we want to illuminate that. And then uh, what happens? Now, you saw that the uh, polymer changes shape, right? But um, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if you have a photonic crystal, like the one that I've drawn over there, the photonic crystal will have optical properties that will depend on its size and on its shape because it is a structure and, and the structural properties, they give rise to photonic properties. It will have colors and it will have uh, reflections of light in various directions and resonances inside for the light based on its structure. But if that structure is now illuminated and it will change shape, then this will change. So there will be a two-way action. The light will create a deformation, but the deformation will change the optical properties of the material. So this is what we want to play with. We have a two-way action. The light changes the shape of these structures, but when the shape has been changed, that will influence the optical response of the structure. And this is the key which we see somehow also for a future idea of um, some form of uh, neural network, which is still totally to be explored. And again, if somebody has ideas and want to talk about it, then I'm extremely happy. But the idea that I had in mind for a long time and that we're trying to explore is that you have this kind of material, you shine light on it and it has um, a complicated optical response like a neural network where you have, for instance, a speckle pattern that is being generated by different layers, things like that. Um, like we also saw this week. Um, uh, but then um, by giving a feedback uh, in the learning process, um, this will change the shape of the material. And by doing so, by changing the shape, the optical properties will change. So use this feedback loop between shape change and optical response to make something that is learning something. But let's back, go back to the robotics. This is, for instance, an idea what we, what we explored. This, was, this, is, this is a very difficult thing to make. This is, um, um, this is one of the results that we got here. This is a gripper. This is a tiny little gripper of uh, about 100 micrometer in size. So this is very small. The light is here in the middle and um, it is moving in and out of the light beam. And uh, when it goes into the light beam, um, it will uh, deform, the polymer will deform. And that means that it will start to grab something. Um, keep in mind that the only thing that is here, um, um, that is here providing the source of energy is the light. And that is an important issue. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we believe that micro robotics um, uh, is so good to do with uh, light as a, um, and with these materials. Because if, you, if you're so small, if you have something which is really so small as 100 micrometers, there's no way that you can have batteries. Um, they don't exist simply so small. So you need a source of energy somehow. So if you do that electrically, you have to connect wires and you have to have wires so you don't have a really free robot if you want. You have to go wires, uh, go somewhere. But now if you have light, um, you can just shine light on something. Yes, you have to be able to see it. So you have to have some 
optical path to it, but at least the object can be free to go around. And it doesn't, is not physically connected to something. So light from the environment as a source of energy. Now, how does that work here? Um, more on a molecular level, I will show you a little bit of the molecules also because it is so important. Um, responsiveness to light, so how can you get a shape change in a molecule? Well, um, this is a little piece of our uh, molecule. It is only a tiny little bit of uh, what in the end we have. It is a, a small a group here, it's called an azobenzene group. And this is embedded somehow in this much bigger uh, structure. These polymers, of course, are much, much, much bigger molecules. Um, but this is embedded into that. And what does it do? This group here, this can make a, a transition from this trans configuration, as it's called, to a cis configuration. Nothing happened on the level of the chemistry. No atoms were detached or something. But the whole molecule um, changed shape. It just rotated into this kind of banana shape. So let me do this right. So it is like that. And then it, it uh, yeah, my hands have to be able to physically to do it. So it twisted into this banana shape. Okay. And that is when you shine light on it. And you can do this with light. You can go in one direction and you can go in the other direction. Depends a little bit on the molecule that you have. Some molecules have to go, go back um, by shining another color. So in this case, UV to go like that and visible light to go like that. You can also have molecules that uh, go back by themselves. So you shine light on it and they go in one direction and you just switch off the light and they go back. Or you can even have molecules that respond to heat. So you shine light on it, the light will heat, uh, uh, heat up the, the, the locally the, uh, the molecule. And because it changes temperature, it will do the same trick. And then it cools down and it goes back. So these are the kind of different strategies, the three different strategies that we have in our materials. Two colors of light or one color and go back by yourself or temperature go up with high temperature and go down with low temperature, which you also can induce with light. How you induce this temperature change with light. And this is what you have. You have these pieces of molecule embedded. And if you are in this uh, configuration, you have a nomadic phase. So you have order. This is this liquid crystalline property of the material. And then you go to the other configuration and you get these bananas somewhere into the, they don't have to be everywhere, but you have to have only a few, you can have only a few of them, a small, percentage and that's already enough to disturb the order in the system. This order, this pneumatic order is possible because the environment is clean and everything is aligned. If you have let's say only one percent of, of, of bits of molecule that change shape, you disturb the order in the entire pneumatic phase and every the entire pneumatic phase will go over into an isotropic phase and that will create a big uh, shape change. As I said, the effect is very big and it is also very strong. Um, the material really changes shape. There's basically nothing that you can do about it that it doesn't change shape. The only thing that you can do about it is that it would break or that it would be... Uh, um, this is, let's say, uh, another way to look at it. Um, here you are in a disordered phase and here you are in an ordered phase. Don't, don't, don't worry too much that this is here. Um, uh, uh, about the catalyst, ah, okay, sorry, the catalyst is here because you're actually linking them. So here you you have the, this is how you make them. So here you have the, 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 the different uh, components, the bits and pieces, the mesogens. So you want to link them all together. And you do that in the chemical process. You have these all, in this case, they are linking head to tail. And, um, and you form this phase uh, in this way. Um, now, how to form that, we will come to that later, and how to get that into a microstructure is, of course, important if you make a, a robot out of this. Um, as I said here, um, you have, uh, then you have the change, and then you, you, with a stimulus in one way or another, you get a deformation or you get a shape change. That is what it is all about. <laughs> Now, as I said, we have to, when you have a material that changes shape, um, that's only one ingredient. Uh, if you want to make a robot or maybe some, in the future, some kind of neural network out of this, then you have to have a way to make this into a, a pattern. You have to have a, um, a, a technology available that makes the shape of a leg, 
or a, a gripper or, or, or a whole robot or whatever you want. And what we use here is basically a form of uh, 3D laser printing. So it is called direct laser writing. Um, it is using a laser and uh, this laser is, uh, uh, let's say, focusing light into a substrate, which is over here. You will see that on the next slide, you will see that more in detail. And you're basically just doing a form of 3D printing, but extremely accurately. And you see some um, examples here. You see this uh, uh, very beautiful, clean. This is a periodic structure over here, which has been made. But look at the scale bar. This is 100 uh, um, nanometers over there. And so this is a really um, amazingly accurate and clean um, structure that you can make out of this. So it is 3D printing, yes, but it is extremely accurate and, and very clean 3D printing. Um, here you see how it works. If you, if as I said, here you in this area where you focus the light in in the sample. If you look at that more carefully, you have a substrate. You have some a droplet of um, of this mixture that I showed a few slides before. I showed you this mixture where you have the different components that have to um, come together and that have to be formed into a network. Um, here you have that happening, and the trigger here is now the place place where the laser is focused. So you have this mixture and you make it such that um, the laser light, um, uh, let's say, triggers a catalyst um, such that the uh, chemical reaction starts. And the chemical reaction will take place at the focus of the laser point, of the laser. And then the laser is scanned through this droplet. The light actually comes from the bottom. And then where you have the focus, you actually create the uh, the polymer network and here this way you can build up something as which has uh, any kind of complicated shape right um there's one trick to all this uh, which is not of course something that we developed but which is something which is typical for for um uh, this uh, direct laser writing and that is that you use two photon absorption why is that good um if you have a normal light beam, and this is a focus, it looks like that. You, know, you get a, this, this, this green here, over here is the light. And you focus it here, you get this Gaussian focus. The best you can do is something like this. And then, of course, if you would simply absorb directly this light, you would get an intensity distribution which looks like this. And that means that in the end, where you will trigger the chemical reaction is a pretty big area. But now if you use two photon absorption, it becomes a nonlinear process. So it doesn't depend linearly anymore now on the intensity, but it depends quadratically on the intensity. And what you then get if you focus here, see you focus red light and you want green, so you want to take the second harmonic here. And that's what you see here. And you see here this tiny little dot, which is of course much smaller because now you have something that depends quadratically on the intensity and it doesn't depend linearly on the intensity. It's a technical trick, but it is very important to make accurate structures. And here you see it happening. Um, this is a movie uh, made by um, a guy at Vilnius University. Um, I don't remember the name now at the moment. For somehow the reason the text is gone here, but I'll give you his name if, uh, if, you, if you, want, uh, you want to know it. He made this beautiful movie um, of actually the direct laser writing in uh, ongoing so you actually see through the microscope this is real time of course this is overexposed that's where the laser is but it's simply overexposed and you see here is this he is making this 3d buckyball structure this is the 3d printing in progress um these are basically the pixels with which you are doing your 3d printing and uh, you're overlapping them a little bit um the laser is pulsed, so you're shooting, uh, you're making pixel by pixel, you're constructing this. If you, if you wouldn't have them overlapping, the whole thing would fall apart. If I put a pixel here and a pixel there and a pixel there and a pixel there, and then I remove the liquid, then it falls down as a, as a powder. Huh? So I have, to, um, I have to make sure that my structure is something which is connected or somehow that it remains a shape um, when I'm finished. Uh, at the end, the liquid goes, and the solid part remains, and then the solid part has to stand together somehow. And this is here, uh, again, a photograph of a structure which is made in this way, overlapping voxels, 
such that the voxel is basically the pixel, the 3D pixel with which you are doing your writing. It still has a little bit elongated shape because you're focusing here from the bottom and it doesn't, it never really becomes a perfect sphere, but it is, let's say, much closer to a, a sphere uh, because it is two photon absorption than it would be if you would do single photon absorption. And then you would really get kind of uh, something that looks like this or so if you if, if you would focus so this is a pretty good uh, high resolution uh, voxel that you can get um, in this uh, using two photon absorption okay so there's one thing that i wanted to show you here this is a, a beautiful project uh, that sarah did uh, in the group with an artist from rome um, this is how 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 far you can push this technology this is a small statue that was made uh, by the, the nanoscribe, um, uh, the 3D laser printer that, that she made. This is a small statue and this was actually for a, a science and art project. This is if you look at it from the top, look at the amazing resolution that you can have in making such structures. Um, this was for a science and art um, uh, exhibition and this was uh, the, the artist was a Namsal uh, uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, of course with Sarah Nocentini from our group, they worked together and what they did was the artists want, the artists wanted to grab the moment um, in which we are living now, uh, which is the pandem pandemia and then you have this virus going around and you know, never know if you have it on you or you don't have it on you and you get uh, this, this creates a strange state of mind and he wanted to transform that into something positive and he wanted to make an art uh, performance exhibition about it. So Sarah, uh, she, she, she made these statues um, and, um, and they were then released in space uh, with public. Uh, and of course, this is a very small uh, statue. So here's the scale bar, 40 micrometers. So this whole thing is 100 micrometers or something. So you don't see it by naked eye. So he, the, the artist released the, the statue in free space and then it somehow ended up somewhere on somebody in the public who probably still has it in his or her hair or somewhere in the jacket or wherever and we don't know where it is. So it got, it, it was freed in space, let's say. So this was the artist's view of, and I, I liked it very much actually. But I'm showing it here um, because I wanted to show you the, the amazing things that you can do with this direct laser writing and this 3D print. So now we get to the soft robotics um, and the, the micro robotics. We're talking about soft robotics here in the sense that we're talking about materials that are soft. Um, these polymers are quite so reasonably soft materials. They come in various grades of being soft. They can be very soft and fluffy, which is not so good because then if you make a robot and it is too soft and it just will, it will not be able to stand on its legs. So you have to find some compromise there. But soft robotics in general is, of course, uh, a big topic and uh, also on, on many different scales. This is, these are all sorts of soft robotics that are uh, around, uh, soft or hard or mixtures of them. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a soft robot over here. Um, and this is something which is more uh, like a human hand and all this kind of thing. So if soft has advantages, um, it doesn't hurt you so much to start with and, and all these kind of things. So this is, an, this is as such a huge field of physics and engineering and we're only contributing a tiny little part to that uh, on the length scale which is so far hardly explored. Uh, this length scale of 100 micrometer is, is very little explored. It's very small, tiny um, uh, uh, robots, let's say. So, um, we we wanted to do here photonic objects so they have some photonic properties possibly can, that can walk swim and fly um just for the fun of it let's say that was the start at least to try if this is possible and then we will come to some real applications uh, later on but we started with a, a just a, a creative idea and the reason for trying it um, and I think that's a very good reason if somebody asks you why are you doing this well it, because it has not been done before that as such is already plenty of motivation to try to do something new so the idea was here can we make a robot that is a photonic object and it can swim walk and fly and then we will see later um, where this could be useful and I'll show you some useful things later on and then here as I said the environmental light as an energy source 
um, as I said, there's no batteries in those length scales. So this is an important issue. Now it doesn't have to be a laser. So you can have a, a robot that you can shine a laser on it, but it doesn't have to be like that. It can be light from the environment. It can be maybe at a certain stage, even sunlight. And certainly it can be a lamp light if the lamp is strong enough. Uh, light from the environment. The light induces the deformation, yeah? so the light creates the movement of things, but it can also be used to control things. So a red light to go left and green light to go right or things like that. That's the idea. And nature is a source of inspiration. So this guy over there, of course, nature is a source of inspiration. Nature is amazingly powerful. I mean, think of it, a fly um, that flies or a mosquito, the magic of uh, of that a mosquito is possible. Try making something that is as small as a mosquito and have it fly in the lab. Try that. I mean, this is kind of amazing, the energy efficiency of tiny little animals and, and the things, the amazing things that they can achieve. So when you start to do a project like this, it becomes uh, impossible to, uh, to, uh, to kill uh, even a mosquito because you appreciate the amazing beauty of all the things that nature uh, has has provided and has has generated, let's say, even a mosquito becomes an amazingly beautiful um, creation. Um, just to, to get a flavor of, of 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 small small walking creatures in nature, this is an actual scale of a microendemic leaf chameleon. This animal actually exists. This is already very small, and this is walking. We are going to look at walking animals now. Um, but this is still res relatively big. Uh, we want to go to things that are even smaller. Um, so we have these animals, that, these are kind of the smallest animals that exist in nature that, that are walking. The tardigrade is actually a very um, common walking animal. These are other examples of that. And what we're getting to is this kind of artificial walker. Here we've put it on top of a human hair. This was the hair of my postdoc, um, 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 and he, uh, a PhD student, and he put the uh, Hao Zeng, and he put the robot on his own hair and made the photo there. Um, the tardigrade is another miracle of nature here. Um, this is a, a more close-up photo of the tardigrade. As I said, it can live in all sorts of environments, um, and it does actually on our planet in, in many, many different places. Um, this is the Latin name for it. 50 micrometers is the scale bar here. So we're talking about an animal that is very small. Now, if you're getting very small, the laws of physics, of course, are the same, but they behave in ways that are counterintuitive. And um, if you are very small, then uh, friction and uh, becomes more important. S surfaces and the environment, they become much more sticky than we are used to on our scale. Well, at the other hand, inertia becomes something that is quite irrelevant if you're so small. So inertia does not play a role anymore, while surfaces tend to become relatively sticky compared to your own uh, strength. And this animal here walks on the tip of his toes here, so it, it minimizes surface contact. And that is um, um, because compared to the muscle strength that an animal like this can generate, um, the, uh, the, 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 the surface forces here are big and it, the animal doesn't want to get stuck. Um, the, the world looks like very much like glue. Just a few of the properties. I mean, it can survive temperatures that go from one Kelvin to way above boiling point of water. It can go from near vacuum to crazy pressures like 6,000 atmosphere and survive. It even survives dehydration for 97% for 10 years and then you put the water back in and it not only walks again, but it even is able to reproduce and it even can withstand gamma radiation that is totally lethal to humans. So again, uh, the miraculous properties of uh, the robots that uh, the robots, the, the, the natural, the animals that live in, in nature and that are, can never be matched uh, by artificial robots. Um, as I said, if you go to those length scales, um, uh, uh, there's all sorts of phenomena that take place. Surface tension becomes extremely important. Of course, you know these animals that can walk on water because they, they use the surface tension of the water. So you have to deal with it and you have to deal with all these kind of things also if you try to make robots. And this is not a new problem. Um, Low Reynolds number physics, a living 
uh, life at small length scales, huh? so low Reynolds number physics, that's what we're talking about. This is a very nice paper by Purcell, and I'm showing it also because the, the drawings and the figures were entirely done by hand here. And what he is looking at here is how it is to swim. So he's defining here, here's the Reynolds number, and the Reynolds number gives you the, the ratio between the inertial forces and the viscous forces. And now the argument is here, if you have an object of a certain size, A, that is going with a certain velocity in a, in a liquid with a certain density and with a certain viscosity, how is now the ratio between the inertial forces and the viscous forces? And if you're swimming and you're very small, so if you're, if you're swimming and you're big, like a human being, then you use also the inertial part because you have a fast stroke and, and a slow stroke and the inertial forces, they play a role. But if you become very small, then this Reynolds number becomes very small, becomes a very small number. And then everything is dominated by the viscous forces. So it is like being in honey. It is being in something really viscous. And he shows, I'm showing here you the figures because I thought they were really beautiful. Um, this is figure three of this paper of Purcell. This is the Reynolds number 10 to the four for a human being. This is his drawing of a human being. Here we have some small fish and here we have some microorganisms that are swimming. And so the strategy for moving or for propulsion has to be very different. And then he comes up with this scallop theorem. And this is the scallop which is drawn there. And that means that um, if, you, if you do a motion, uh, here are the Navier-Stokes equation, equations in the liquid. Um, he says time doesn't matter. The pattern of motion is the same, whether slow or fast. And so inertia doesn't play a role. So if I do a certain pattern, if I if I perform that slow or I perform that fast, it doesn't make a difference. It, it does make a difference if I'm big. If I do a fast stroke or I do a very slow stroke, that will make a difference for me. But it does not for a, a very small animal. So you have to make some kind of movement that is not reciprocal in time. Because if you do something fast like that and slow like that, you're exactly where you were before if you're, if you're so small. And here are some strategies for swimming, which are, of course, adopted in nature, um, like the corkscrew over here. This is just twisting all the time like a, small, like a drill. And it is ba you're basically drilling yourself through the fluid, if you want. And um, this is... a. a, a, a this is flapping up and down, and this is also creating a movement which allows you to go in a certain direction. Okay, let me show you some results of this material. This is something very simple. This is just a finger. His finger is being illuminated and is made by two materials. On one side is a material that is contracting and the other side is a material that is doing nothing. So it's like a bilayer. And then you shine light on it and it is relatively slow still here, the response, but it is responding and it is bending, the fingertip is bending in one direction, some preliminary results. You can also make something that is bistable. In this case, it is bistable by a very simple strategy because it moves and it goes in and out of the light beam. That is kind of a trivial way of getting something bistable, but it is bistable and it starts to uh, uh, starts to oscillate even if the light is CW. Um, nothing in principle um, prohibits you to do this in a more sophisticated way because think of the beginning when I said you have a photonic crystal. Um, if you would have this photonic crystal and you shine light on it, now if this photonic crystal contracts then um, the resonances inside the photonic crystal will change frequency because they will depend on the shape of the photonic crystal. So if you design this properly, one of the ideas that um, I think is interesting to develop is that you shine light on it, you make the resonances inside change frequency, and then it will go in the resonance, out of resonance, in resonance, out of resonance, in resonance, out of resonance, and it will become bistable, like something that you have over here. This is a twisting thing. Um, that's also something that you would need. Huh? You need to have something that is be able, being able to rotate. And this is what is happening over here. So this is a fiber that is rotating. Um, this was an artifact uh, which I want to show you because it's nice to show also what really happens in the lab. We never really understood what this was. A nut uh, was um, uh, created here at the fiber tip. Unfortunately, we were not able to reproduce it. So this can be published in the journal of irreproducible results and that's it 
but the nice thing about it is that it um, it unfolds and it opens as a fiber tip, and then it comes back and it not, it, ma it makes itself in a nut again. We never really understood it. So here's the microscopic hand. I show you that already. It, it you go into the light and it closes, and you go out of the light and it opens again. Again, the only energy source is the light itself. But then you can do many things with that. You can grab some particle. And now, why is this happening? Um, the, the, the particle goes close to the object. The light is always switched on, but then when the particle get, gets close enough, it will absorb the light. Um, it will create a local heating, very locally, and the, uh, the hand uh, senses that and grabs the particle. So you don't tell the hand when to grab the particle. It will know when the particle is there and then grab it, right? So there's a kind of a form of... Um, intelligence if you want or responsiveness at least um, and you can do uh, fancy things with that this is a particle of a certain color it has a certain spectral response and um, the spectral response matches that of the light but then i change the color of the particle and um, actually in this case the particle is completely white so it doesn't have a color um, so it does not absorb the light anymore and the finger doesn't react so not only I can make it grab automatically a particle when it is there, but I can also make it grab a particle of a certain color. I can use a, a, a green laser and it will only grab red particles and it will not grab the green particles. So you can do automatic color selection by grabbing only particles with a certain uh, spectral response. And you could even in principle make it very sophisticated because you could make a very complicated spectral response, not only green and red, but you can make it very, um, specific. Okay, I'm slowly getting to um, uh, the end, but I'll accelerate a little bit to leave some time for questions. Um, the uh, design of the thing which was actually walking was like this. There is a body over here. This body is contract contracting and then it has these legs. These legs point in one direction and they are kind of rigid. Um, a little bit like the tardigrade which was standing on the tip of his toes. Um, these uh, tips, they have to be a kind of uh, rigid and small in surface, because if not, it will just stick too much. S same like the animal, right? Um, and here uh, you have some uh, comparison of the adhesion forces. This is what I was saying before. If you go very small, this becomes a relevant comparison. This is the adhesion force. This is how much the environment is sticking. It will depend, of course, on what kind of surface you have. And these are kind of the muscle stresses that you can generate. So if you're in the region where the adhesion force is 1.3 and the muscle stress is 0 0.01, you're just stuck, right? Now, this is, of course, uh, uh, this is per unit area. So um, you want to make, uh, you want to take into account also that, that, that aspect. And you have here, you have a big muscle, so you can create a lot of muscle stress but you have a small surface contact. So you have a small adhesion force. And that's why the muscle is much bigger and can generate much more force than, uh, than the force of the adhesion because hey, we have made the tip so small here. The design is actually the design, uh, same design as a children's toy of the, of the uh, toothbrush robot. This thing is shaking and then the toothbrush robot will go like that because the hairs here, they are a little bit bent and there will be more friction in that direction and less friction in this direction because they are a little bit bent like that. And if I'm trying to move this, they will just slide over the surface, but in this direction, they will get jammed. And that's why um, it goes in one direction. But then we made it and that was fun. Uh, this is the design here of the, this is the actual photograph of the, um, of, the, um, of the thing. We also have a paper here on swimming, which I'm not uh, reporting about, um, but we also looked at, at swimming structures. But anyway, um, these are the legs, they're pointing in a certain direction. This is how it is moving if you shine light on it. The light in this case is flashing. And this is how it is moving. You really get the feeling it wants to walk. That's funny how the human brain um, works. I mean, you look at this and then your brain kind of it gives you the feeling that this thing is already alive and that it wants to walk. Of course, it's just a piece of polymer and that's it. Um, we put it on a surface, but then it turned out to be walking in, let's say, let's call it the wrong direction. Toothbrush robot would walk um, to this side, so to the right side, 
And this was walking in the opposite direction compared to the toothbrush robot. It was walking in the direction in which the toothbrush robot has actually more friction. And so for some reason here, things are upside down. And for some, some reason here, the friction is, um, is less in that direction. And again, the solution for that is found in nature. This animal over here, the jacko, has amazing properties of walking on surfaces like the wall, like the ceiling. It can walk on hydrophobic surfaces, hydrophilic surfaces. It can walk on all kinds of surfaces. It can stick to the ceiling. And it can also, it can walk on the ceiling, but it can also make a step. So it isn't stuck forever to the ceiling, but it can stick and then make a step and then stick again. This is not trivial because you have to be able to grab the ceiling, but you have to also be able to peel off and to make a step to the next location. And this is when you look at the foot here of the jacko. You might have seen these pictures already uh, in other occasions. The secret apparently is in the fact that this animal has these um, hairs on the tip of his foot, many, 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 many of them. And each of the tips of those hairs, they go very, very close to the surface. And then there is a delicate balance of all sorts of forces which are uh, playing a role there. But one of those forces that apparently starts to be relevant is the van der Waals force, because you can get so close to the surface. Now, what happens then, the van der Waals force depends on how much surface actually is in contact, how much surface of your foot is in contact with the surface on which you're trying to walk. And then um, think of it, if I'm like this on a surface, if I'm going in that direction, I will increase the surface. So I will stick more. It's like when I'm on a piece of scotch. Um, if I try to go in that direction, I will increase the surface so I will get more sticky. But if I try to walk in that direction, I peel myself off and I have less friction. So the friction direction, the, 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 the biggest friction is now in the opposite direction. Here it is walking. Um, this is, one, this is uh, one of the first results that we have and we see it here in the video and it is going around. It is a little bit unguided uh, yet. It is going uh, a little bit in a, a certain direction, but um, it is definitely walking. And it is actually walking also pretty fast. It is walking out of the, out of the illuminated area, which you don't see on the, on the film. And that's why we have to move it back and forth by hand to get it back into the illuminated area. Here's some other designs. This is a design which has ridges as, uh, instead of feet. So it has more surface contact. These are ridges and there are three of them. Of course, it doesn't have to be four legs. I mean, nature often uses four legs, but it can be anything. So you can ex explore that as well. And anyway, so I give you a few little bit more um, other uh, things that came out of this that you can do. One thing is that is, is hydrophobicity. So um, this plant over here, uh, the lotus leaf, keeps the droplets away from the surface because of the hair that are sticking out and then the droplet is on top. So if this is a droplet over here of water, it will be on top of those tips of those hairs of the plant and that is why it doesn't wet the surface. And you can do that, you can mimic that, um, although we still don't have any measurements that, that, you that show the actual hydrophobicity or the hydro uh, felicity, but um, this is the idea here to um, to have the, the hair coming up and out. And now we're talking about applications. One of the applications that uh, is that um, um, we were recently contacted by a company that actually wants to explore robots for going into the human body. And uh, not in the bloodstream because that is too violent, but in other parts of the human body. And we are going to explore that together. That's extremely exciting. Um, and they are a company, of course, that invests in that. So that means that they are taking it serious. As I said, I think good science starts with just an idea. You try and you see where it goes. You try just because it hasn't been tried yet. But then, of course, if some, something comes out of that, and it becomes a real application, then, of course, it is extremely rewarding. And then the last one as application is uh, this one. And this was an idea of Camilla and, and Daniela. They explored this together. Uh, is doing something of a polymer together with biological tissue. So living cells, um, you take a polymer and you put the cells on top of the polymer. Um, and in this case, um, uh, they managed to make a cardiac assist device out of that. So you take the polymer that we had before, you put um, uh, cells and you, you merge them. Now, if you, if you 
you know, in this case, we are very lucky because the material is totally biocompatible. So the cells not only not, they not die, but they remain active. So the idea is to have a hybrid system in which you have some polymer on, uh, uh, that, is, that is the polymer which is uh, reacting. And on the other side, you have living cells and they are kind of merged together. And uh, by doing so, you have a hybrid system, right? You have something that is contracting because it is the polymer and you have something that is contracting because it is a, a, a muscle tissue. And here you see some of the uh, alignment of the material and you see uh, the cells, let's say, on top of the material, they are, they are alive and they are aligned in certain directions. Then you have to understand, for instance, there's some very interesting things here, again, in biology, I mean, if you put stem cells on top of the polymer and then you have the polymer contract, then the stem cells, they differentiate into muscle cells. Now, do they do that in a certain direction because the polymer is contracting or because there is a molecular alignment or what are the reasons that the tissue or that the muscles, uh, the muscle cells that differentiate in a certain direction? This is a very interesting, interesting aspect. And here's the, the cardiac assist device and you see that it is working. So um, this is really the last slide. Now this is just a little piece of muscle. And then this is with the polymer on top of it, but no activation. And this is when you activate it. And what you see here below, um, here in the left is, let's say the, the, the heart muscle, which is not working so well anymore because the patient, let's say, would be um, uh, suffering from some weakness of the heart muscle. And, but then when you switch the, uh, then when you attach the polymer, nothing changes. So this is just the muscle, muscle plus polymer, same response. But then you switch on the light and you have it flashing exactly at the same uh, frequency of the heartbeat. And then suddenly the, uh, the response is, uh, is much better. You see it here also here below. This is the uh, muscle without the light. And then you switch on the light and you strengthen the action of the, uh, so that's why it's called a cardiac assist device. So that's for the end. And um, I'm, uh, I, I try to keep some time also for, for questions and ideas and discussion and whatever that is possible online. So thanks a lot for such a beautiful talk. So inspiring and many new ideas. So uh, typically we wait a bit for, for if there is some question in the chat, so. I can start the discussion. I see that most of the activity is really fascinating and it is based on photochemical effect, if, if I'm right. So do you think that other forces can be exploited? For example, I have in mind uh, optical tweezing, you know, you can move objects mm -hmm. and introduce some motion also by, in this way. So what of course. do you think? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Thank you, Claudio. That's, of course, an excellent question. Um, Optical tweezers, we, we, we compare, so just for people who do not know it, for the students, optical tweezers work like you focus a laser beam and then you generate a gradient in the intensity close to, for instance, on a particle and this gradient in the intensity will create a force and this will trap the particle when you move it around. This has been known for a long time already. Um, uh, the forces that we have here um, with, the, uh, with this technology are more, is more, this is much more efficient. So an important problem here is energy efficiency. How much uh, work can you uh, generate uh, with, given a certain amount of energy uh, consumption by the, by the robot? And the energy balance for an optical tweezer is, uh, is terrible. I mean, an optical tweezer is very good for, for moving around one particle, but the intensity is super high uh, mm -hmm. compared to what you have here. Orders and orders and orders of magnitude higher intensity. Um, um, having said that, um, so optical tweezers in, in this case, are, we don't think are a good idea, but there are, uh, so th there's, there's, um, there's here two effects playing a role in the polymer. One is the direct absorption of a photon, which will change the configuration of the molecule from trans to cis. So that is one effect. The other effect is that the photon is first absorbed. It locally generates a little bit of heat and this heat is now used in uh, make, making a mechanical action. And there are certain advantages and disadvantages. So both strategies are okay. The first one is a little bit slower. Um, the second one is a little bit faster. If, if you ask me what is the energy efficiency and how much work can you generate, I can only tell you that I hope to tell you next year because this is a really important question which we are measuring. Um, 
And of course, this is very relevant. Also, the company that we are now going to work with, uh, probably they're going to come next month to the lab to talk. This is the first thing they want to know. So this is probably the first thing that we're going to measure together. Um, but compared to optical tweezers, the efficiency is much better. And if you do a back of the envelope calculation, I don't see any fundamental reason why you couldn't go to uh, the intensity of uh, solar light, uh, solar irradiation uh, uh, at uh, uh, unfocused solar light, let's say. I don't see any fundamental reason why you couldn't reach the regime in which that is enough intensity. And of course, that's never going to be enough intensity for other, other strategies, let's say. But, uh, so maybe you can read the questions that we have a couple. Uh, I don't see the chat. Let in the, see. Yes, in the bottom line, there is Q and answer. You see that? OK, yeah, I have to go there. Yes, of course. If not, in the meantime, if you want chat, so I see one chat. That's the only thing I see. There's a sort of Q and A uh, label, uh, labeling the bottom line. Let me get that. You should see that. Uh, Do you want to select yourself? Why don't you select one or two questions and then uh, I answer yes, the, them? The first one is, of course, uh, everybody is enthusiastic about your, your talk. Uh, so uh, the, the question is from Matilde. Maybe Matilde can also speak if she, she, she wants uh, to. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, just a second. Uh, okay, Matilde, now you should be able to speak uh, in some sense. Okay. Can you try that? Uh, yes, do you hear me? Okay. Yes, hi, Matilde. Good morning. Hi. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, so, my question was um, on what depends the response of time of the material to light? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, can you give some example of the, the light source that you used for the video you made? Yeah, excellent question. So um, thank you for that. So the, uh, the time uh, response, the response time for the robot, uh, we measured that, the walking robot, we measured it and uh, you could go up to, let's say, a frequency, a repetition rate of about 10 kilohertz, something like that, you could go. So that would correspond to, uh, let's say, 0 0.1 millisecond. Uh, of course, if you go faster and faster, then the actual uh, excursion becomes less. So if you have a, if you have a block of material and it and it contracts, if you if you if you if you go, let's say, if this is the full excursion, if you go faster, maybe the excursion will not be full anymore, but it will be only partial. But that's okay. And um, so typically one millisecond, you would have a full excursion, 0 0.1 millisecond, you would have a partial excursion or something like that. But we're on that order of, of magnitude. And um, if you use a polymer, which is entirely uh, optical, so no heating uh, going on, um, then it will be slower. And then it can be of the order of uh, 0 0.1 second even or something like that. So then it becomes a little bit too slow for, for the things that we had in mind. But for other applications, it might be it might be good as well. It depends on the kind of polymer, and it depends on the uh, strategy uh, that you use for exciting them. What we used was uh, was a laser, uh, but it was just because it was a handy light source that we had in the lab because we have so many lasers around. But uh, in principle, you could and and we have a well defined color then, so we could choose the color more easily. But there's no really there's no reason that you need a laser. It doesn't have to be coherent. For instance, the light. Uh, you could just use a focused lamp, and it would be fine. Of course, you have to think a bit about the uh, color. Um, uh, if you if you use a broadband uh, illumination, so all colors, or you use a specific color that will that will change certain things. Like if you have the the hand which will grab the particle. Um, you want to match the, the wavelengths of the light with the wavelengths of the absorption. But then if you, if you come in with a light, with light which has all sort of other wavelengths as well, in principle, this is not a problem. So you have to keep just that in mind. But for the rest, you can, use a, you can use kind of any light source if it is strong enough. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, then we have another question from uh, Stanio Ranzini. I guess Stanio can, can talk. Or... Yes, uh, thanks very much for the very interesting talks. Far from my field, but I really appreciate. 
And I, I'm, maybe I have a naive question is about the unreproducible unre results that you try to reproduce. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to maybe use machine learning to find mm. out the input parameters to reproduce, to try to just learning what was the input parameter to generate the figure? I don't know if you have the model. Yeah, it's, a nice, it's a nice idea to apply machine learning also in general in the design um, so uh, for, for this one irreproducible result, uh, maybe it's a little bit difficult because I, I can give the, the neural network only one example because I have only one sample. So I don't, I don't have a lot of statistics to, to show him for, for learning something. I don't know if that's a problem. Um, on the other hand, your, 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 your question is very inspiring because uh, when you kind of make a structure, you have... You, well, you can think about, you have many parameters because you want to, with the direct, with the printing, you want to make some structure, but you want to also have a stress in this direction or a stress here, or maybe locally you have a force there or a force there. What is a good design to make a functionality which is uh, maybe more complicated? Because now it was very simple, right? Grabbing or walking, but maybe you can make something much more interesting and actually what I really was hoping to make some kind of very complicated blob or network in which the light is coming in you generate speckle um, inside and then at the output you have some kind of response and you make an optical neural network like this and then the 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 response of the inside should be such that it should be it should adapt itself uh, physically uh, uh, to, let's say, the learning process. Now, what you're saying maybe is a new idea, which I didn't think of. Maybe you can actually use machine learning to design some neural network like that, which then you would be able to use for machine learning. But um, I have to think about it, yeah. Uh, thanks for the, for the answer. Mm. Thank you for the question. Thanks a lot. Uh, this looks very, very exciting. Uh, I, I guess that it seems to me that you are at the beginning, so you need still yeah. to develop all the control of these robots, which is uh, different from the conventional control. Yes. And that, and that machine learning can be yeah. useful. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I do not see other questions, so I want to thank Diederik again for such a beautiful talk. So yeah, thank, thank you for having me here and uh, good to, to, to be together. Uh, uh, if somebody wants to chat uh, later on or just send me an email or uh, then uh, we can uh, substitute the, uh, the walking along the lake with uh, sending emails is the best we can do, let's say. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we can switch to the next speaker, which is also another very exciting uh, subject. Uh, Daniel, are you around? Uh,